This is April's Ballotpedia's Insights. So we are doing a Q&A series with political and legal scholars, researchers, reporters, and subject matter experts. Today, of course, it's going to be the subject matter experts, the subject being campaign managers. Um, we want to know from the two Jeffs, Jeff Hewitt and Jeff Rowe, how to run a campaign. So here at Ballotpedia, we have seen the interest in the 2020 primary spiking already. Um, our readers and our friends just can't get enough of what's happening in the Democratic field, how that'll play out then in the 2020 general election, and just everything that's happening in a campaign at an early stage like this. Um, so we want to define two campaign managers this month who are at the top of their game. So thank you to both Jeff Hewitt and Jeff Rowe. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to both men and then we're going to go ahead and get started with the questions that our staff, our readers, and um, just everybody at Ballotpedia submitted that they want to hear from both of you. Um, as we get going, please feel free to drop in any questions you have. We'll try to take them at the end, but I think we're gonna have a very packed call. So first up, Jeff Hewitt. He has worked in every facet of political campaigns and has earned a reputation during a career spanning over two decades for bringing focus and vision to competitive races. Hewitt served on the Clinton-Gore campaign staff founded a political consulting firm, managed a variety of campaigns, and served as an advisor for a variety of congressional races throughout the U.S. He also founded his own firm in 1998, which is now known as Hewitt Campaigns Incorporated. And he and his staff have been working on dozens of high-profile national, state, and local candidates. And then also with us today, we have Jeff Rowe. He is the founder of Axiom Strategies, which is a firm specializing in strategic consulting, direct voter contact, and research services for congressional, senatorial, and statewide campaigns. Roe is best known for his data-driven and bare-knuckled approach to politics, as well as his role as campaign manager for Ted Cruz's 2016 presidential run, which, as we all know on this call, Cruz did win Iowa, and it was a big, um, big, fascinating, interesting win that was talked about for months and months afterwards. So we're very thankful to have both of you on this call. Um, Let's see, Jeff Hewitt, if you can hear us, please check your email and try that link, the, the panelist link. Um, so we're going to go ahead then and get started with um, a question then for Jeff Rowe. So you've won Iowa. <laughs> what does it take to win Iowa? Uh, you've both worked on presidential campaigns. So Rowe, if you could lay out the strategy for how any campaign, but particularly just what you know from these Democratic type campaigns, what does it take to stand out in a large field in 2020? And how do you elbow your way to standing out in such a big crowd? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thanks for the question. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the work that you guys do. It's actually good to go to a source where I don't have to kind of feed through the blather. As you can see, I didn't realize this when I did it, but MSNBC is in my background. So I always had to watch MSNBC to kind of see what the other side is talking about. It's good to go to have a source where I don't have to worry about filtering through anything. Um, any campaign in a primary comes down to ideology and geography. And so those are the two places where when you, when you have the opportunity to build out a network of voters that agree with you ideologically, or you focus your time geographically, that's where any kind of campaign starts. And I think that's why you're seeing this in a way, this rush to the left. And then an, a reaction to the Democrats running to the left, you see these folks try and stake out a center lane in the Democrat primary. So I can speak all day about the Republican primary and trust me there, I've got a lot of those stats committed to memory because I ran an entire campaign in 2016 for president. I ran a campaign in 14 for US Senate in, um, in Iowa. So I know the state you know, fairly well. In the Democrat primary, what you're seeing right now is the folks are on the rush to the left. About 61% of Democrats in in Iowa agree with really pretty progressive left positions. And because of the compact schedule, Iowa has more of a of a purpose in the electoral process than even typically because they front loaded so many of their primaries. So you 61% of the votes will be cast by today next year. And so because of that, Iowa has a lot of importance because of the balance that then leads you to a state that does not look the same, New Hampshire, and then another state that doesn't look the same, South Carolina. But 
but then you get into Nevada and the big states and it starts to look like Iowa looks and like the progressive kind of left states that come online through the Super Tuesday states. So when we started working in Iowa, it was very important for us to establish our lane and our path to victory. And our path to victory, Ted was well known and somewhat established, although his name ID at the beginning of the primary, at the beginning of the caucus was about 19%, mostly known for the government shutdown. So we took that shutdown base and we added an evangelical communication component to it. We announced that Liberty, not for Liberty, but to send the message to Iowa and the other states. And so we started to lay out this, this ideological lane of a evangelical Tea Party conservative. And I think you see that with the Democrats right now. Some are laying out a very progressive left, democratic socialist left even. But now you see Booker and of course Biden speaking that way and even Beto to a certain degree, more kind of modulating saying, oh my gosh, I actually believe in capitalism, which I can't believe we're in that moment in time, but they actually agree with, with some other um, non-center left positions. And so that's where to start is ideologically. Then you'll see this big blanket of, of Kansas running around and trying to stake it out. And in, in, in Iowa, the Southwest is a very low caucus area for Democrats. So you won't see a lot of Des Moines North and West into Sioux City. That's very conservative. Steve King represents it for a frame of reference. Very conservative part of the state. You'll see a little bit of down from Des Moines to the middle. So everything kind of spokes out from there. For the north, for the southeast um, part of the state is a big base. Uh, up through Cedar Rapids and up through the uh, the the um, the border states on the the border counties and cities on the mississippi um the south and west isn't very good for democrats there's a little bit of populist old you know old um conservative democrats there'll be a few votes there but i think you're going to see almost unlike us in the republican primary we have to go everywhere to kind of find the different populaces we'll go to council bluffs we'll go to sioux city we'll go up in the in the northeast iowa for here, it's going to be the Democrats. It's going to be Des Moines and then over to Cedar Rapids and down a little bit. You're going to see this kind of – that's the geography. So they don't have as much geography, but Des Moines is big. That's where a lot of their votes come from. So they'll be trying to parse out where they set up their offices, where they set up a, sh a shingle. There's nobody with a home field advantage. Klobuchar counts it because, you know, for proximity, but there's no home court advantage. And so I think you'll see these folks kind of break out in this, you know, kind of – sideways L format for your geography. Interesting. Thanks, Jeff. Mr. Hewitt, over to you. Same question. From your Democratic campaign management experience, what do these candidates need to do in the next 12 months to set themselves apart? And I, I'm particularly curious on your thoughts with some of these rule changes for the Iowa caucus this cycle. Does that affect the strategy at all with the with not necessarily needing to be present for the caucus? What do you, what are your thoughts on this? Jeff, I've heard a lot about you, Jeff. Um, and I, of course, uh, use Ballotpedia a lot and sit here and watch Fox News all day. So we're <laughs> sounding like, like we have some things in common. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think the Democratic primary, I mean, Jeff had very specific um, knowledge of Iowa that I will be um, quick to point out that I do not have in that particular state. Um, I haven't been involved in a presidential at that earliest stage. However, I would say about Iowa is that, um, I mean, you know, with, with the Democrats, I think I looked, and if you go back five of the last six nominees, the first two won Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, and so Iowa has had an outsized importance, obviously, throughout the electoral process. Now with California, South Carolina, Texas, and some others following so closely, I think that somewhat um, mitigated this cycle. I think the rules change also mitigate the power of Iowa, so to speak. I think Iowa becomes more of a media narrative about who has momentum. Um, same is true of New Hampshire, although I think with the rule change and as the rule changes and as we've gone forward, I don't know that this cycle, Iowa has the outsized importance, uh, specifically on the Democratic side, um, that it's had in years past. 
So that's, that's my general feeling. I mean, I think that what we're going to see is I think the, the Democratic electorate will start to coalesce around two, three, four candidates um, by, the, say, the end of the year. They will outpace everybody else in fundraising, more than likely. Um, they'll be the ones that have significant operations in the early states. And I think that, you know, whereas Obama back in whatever year, 08, was able to, um, you know, really sort of roll the dice all in in Iowa and put his whole bet there, if you will, I don't think it's of that level of importance this cycle. Um, I think you'll have three to five strong candidates go into those early states. And I don't know that anybody will be coming out, um, quote unquote, a victor. I mean, obviously somebody will win. Um, but I think that there'll be three or four or five that are going to last, you know, late into the spring. And that'll shake itself out. And I believe I will have less importance this cycle, at least on our side than it's had in the past. Do you think that is mostly attributable to the rule changes or is there something else? I know looking at the delegate count, of course, Iowa doesn't have um, nearly the outside influence that, outsized influence that most media outlets give it, but there is still something to say about the momentum there. But do you think something's changed from like the 2008 contest and the 2016 contest other than these big rules changes? Well, I think there's two big things that have changed, right? So number one is the narrative. Um, it used to be that the national news could control the narrative so well because our news sources were so extremely limited. Um, I think as you've got a bifurcation, um, you know, a balkanization, if you will, of media outlets and sources for information, um, it keeps all these candidates' narratives alive um, in a way that, you know, back when it was CNN and the three networks and, and maybe Fox a little bit, um, they could really control and shape the narrative. And I think that you saw that with Obama. I mean, you know, they were eager to set up a, you know, a binary choice there that this time around, there won't be a binary choice. It'll be, you know, my guess is it'll be Biden, uh, Harris, Buttigieg, Beto, and Kamala Harris. You know, that's, that's my guess. It'll come from that group of folks. Um, but I think because the, the media narrative is not as strong, it's not as one directional as it used to be. Um, and I don't mean that in a partisan sense. I mean it in a sense of there's only a few places to get your news. That's changed so much. Um, I think the most important thing is who still has enough money to compete through the spring. Uh, so if, you know, if I were managing a presidential campaign, I'd say, listen, we need to have the resources to compete not just in Iowa, but in Iowa plus four months, okay? And so I wouldn't go all in on Iowa as a Democratic strategist, not this cycle. Fascinating. So let's look beyond Iowa, and I just want to ask both of you the general question that everybody's being asked. Based on just the campaign factors, who's running them, how much money everybody's raising, the media attention that each candidate is getting, who do you both believe is the front runner, not just for Iowa, of course, but just looking at the Democratic nomination as a whole? And I will give the caveat, of course, that nobody was even talking about Trump back in April of 2015. So this is just, just some basic discussion, um, especially when we have a candidate like Biden. How would you run such a campaign in, in the age of Trump? Or, or who do you think has the biggest potential to um, run against a candidate like Trump. We'll start, Jeff, Hugh, sorry, Mr. Hugh with you first, then I'll, <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be tricky, guys. <laughs> hey, no problem. Um, well, you know, I mean, if Biden got in, let's say Biden gets in tomorrow, he's probably leading in the polls and would be considered the front runner. The question is, can he raise these small dollar chunks and compete with, you know, a Buttigieg, a Beto, and a Bernie? And, and Kamala Harris, to some extent, she's, she's shown some ability to raise small dollars. I think Gillibrand's report almost disqualifies her. Um, Klobuchar is not far off. Um, I mean, some of those reports were pitiful. Um, Buttigieg raising the seven million was really the eye opener. I don't think there was any surprise that Bernie Sanders raised eighteen million dollars. You know, the question becomes for me with Joe Biden is, you know, like with Hillary in 08, Not to get too finite, but you know, in Hillary in 08 and Barack. 
or Obama, you know, what you could quickly see was that, or at least someone like me or that's dealt with that stuff, you could tell right away that, you know, Hillary's 40 million came 90% from maxed out donors. So she had a very hard ceiling, if you will, not to use her ceiling pun. Uh, whereas Obama had raised nearly the same amount, um, but it was from, you know, $10 folks. And so his ability to go back to that base was exponential, right? Whereas hers was not. And, you know, I remember thinking pretty early that unless she could raise some small dollars, you know, she was eventually going to lose the marathon. Um, now, if it had been a compact sprint, she probably would have got him. But it wasn't. It turned into a long slog. And the small dollar, the ability to get small dollar contributions, in my mind, is largely why he beat her. Um, now, you can argue his message and this and that and the other, uh, Clinton fatigue, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it was because, you know, Obama constantly had fuel in the jet. Um, and, you know, Hillary had to, she raised her money in chunks. And then they, they didn't necessarily spend it as wisely as you might hope. Um, and so, you know, they'd spend through it and then they'd have to go back and they'd have a harder time sort of refueling whereas Obama never had a lag like that, right? So when you look at Iowa or you look at the first four months of this primary cycle for Democrats, as far as the electoral states, you got to see, well, who's going to have enough fuel for the jet, right? And I just don't think a, a Gillibrand is going to have enough fuel for the jet. Klobuchar is debatable. Um, I think Kamala Harris will, Biden will. But when you get to Biden, you start saying to yourself, is his fundraising situation the same as Hillary's in 08? right? Where he can only go to traditional major donors, get maxed out contributions, and that kind of thing. So, you know, the Beto, the Biden, the Buttigieg, they become, you know, bigger players than they might otherwise be um, because of their ability to raise small dollars. Now, I would like nothing more than to see all that Bernie money start getting turned off, <laughs> quite frankly, and go to Beto or Buttigieg. I, I personally think the favorite right now is if you can believe it, you know, a gay mayor from Indiana. I mean, it, it sounds crazy, um, but I truly believe that, that right this moment, um, he's the one with the most momentum. And he's, if, if I had to bet my own money, that'd be my bet right now. Well, you can on predict it. So um, I know he's jumping. <laughs> There's a plug for our friends over there, but he, we were looking at the, the stat this morning and that's a, been an interesting predictor in previous races of how well a candidate's doing and he's jumping in those, uh, in those and, markets. So. And, you know, for the, the sake of transparency, I spend, you know, most of my year in Ohio and part of my year in Texas, right? So, you know, being in Ohio, you kind of, uh, you know, and I'm being born and raised in Ohio, I'd say I have a more of a Midwest moderate centrist view of the electorate. Um, you know, an AOC to me is anathema to ever winning a national election, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is get back to the center and whether that's a Biden, um, I mean, Harris, you know, Harris isn't bad. Buttigieg, if you listen closely, um, you know, he's, he's a fairly moderate candidate. Uh, he has some stuff that's not, of course, but he's, he's sort of straddling that fence, I believe, better than any of the rest and maintaining an ability to actually win an election. Interesting, thank you. And, I'm, and I'd love to hear Jeff's thoughts on what I just said. Yeah, let's turn any, it over any, for- Any version of that. <laughs> yep, yep. Yep, I wanna hear your, your opinion, Mr. Rowe. Well, uh, a Republican talking about a Democrat primary, you know, is, is um, take it for what it's worth. But I see it from a, from a standpoint of like an NCAA bracket, and you have the the have the establishment Democrats, you have the the center Democrats, you have the progressive, the center left, I'll allow we call them, and then the straight up progressive um, AOC type of wing of the party, and they've got to kind of beat other people in their own lane. And why I, I think that he's right about Kirsten Gillibrand, why her candidacy is is probably almost already over, is because if Biden in fact gets in is because it's Biden's lane and she's a hard dollar establishment folks and, and moderate Democrats have a hard time raising money online. They have a bundlers though, are as fickle as online donors and as fast as they can come, they can go away. And so I think that there's going to be a Biden is going to be, if he gets in, 
um, if he gets in, that I think it's the final four, if you will. And I and I, I I'm still watching. I call him Mayor Mayor Pete. I'm not as good with the how to say his name, but I, I'm not for sure that he's there yet. He's going through his boomlet, but he's had no of the of the of the of the um, the bad light that comes with being on a boomlet. He's had all the upside, and there's a lot of upside that he's gaining. He's gained eight points in Iowa over the past the last three weeks. He just had his announcement where they ignored several other candidates' announcements over his. I can't believe. Most people would not know the Booker announced his candidacy um, over the weekend. The problem for Booker is, again, he's in Biden's lane. He's actually campaigned as a moderate. And, um, and so I think you have Biden coming out. I think Bernie Sanders, I think there's two things that you have to be really careful there. One is to discount him in this race in the primary, and two is to discount him in the general. He can absolutely be president of the United States. And he has a rock foundation. Others that have tried to penetrate it have failed. We saw uh, Beto try and penetrate it, and and they kicked kicked him out. You know, I think he would have won last time if he would have been serious about his campaign from the beginning. Um, he's retooled his team. I can't. I don't know what to take from that. You know, he has a different set of advisors, but um, but I think those two are the the dominant. And I think Kamala Harris and either Beto or Mayor Pete are the final four. And after that, I think it's going to be pretty hard for me to, to guess how that plays out. I think it's going to be a war of the party between the progressives and the centers. When you have Nancy Pelosi last night on 60 Minutes saying that AOC only has five people following her, I expect that she'll get more than five emails this morning from people that disagree on that. And uh, so I, I think that's what we'll see. Jeff and I talk a lot about the money, and I want to talk about why to a degree. Um, when Sanders was not real in Iowa until he started advertising. And when we all, Jeff and I watched, you know, the, the boob tube up here on, on cable news right now at this moment, if we're lucky, there's 400,000 people with me watching MSNBC and there's about 750 or maybe 800,000 watching Fox and 250,000 watching CNN. And so when you talk about the cumulative, airtime that we watch like you know breathlessly and out of 330 million people 120 million people are going to vote and 2 million are watching tv right now you know following politics it's really a subsample of a subsample so to really advertise to have the staff and the and the travel that it requires to be a presidential candidate these folks are going to run, run out of money very quickly because the campaign started so early all these folks, when Elizabeth Warren kicked it off on New Year's Eve with her tweet, I mean, we were the first ones in in 2016. We were the first ones in on March 23rd. And we were the first one, and nobody else in, until until after Easter. Easter was earlier in April that year. But I think Rand Paul was the second one, like April 8th. So we had two weeks to ourselves, And we were the first ones in. Now the last ones are getting in, you know, by April. And uh, obviously Trump didn't come down the escalator until I think it was June. So they're starting so early. Democrats are a high-touch operation from a presidential standpoint. They believe in staff. They believe in ground and field and knocking doors. That requires a lot of body count in their campaign headquarters, Great. which is a good way to kill a campaign is to hire a bunch of staff. And so they're not going to get the run rate, you know, their monthly nut on a, on a presidential campaign. Ours at the height, we had 178 employees. When you've got a monthly run rate that these folks will have if they have 100 employees plus the travel, plus every employee has to, you know, get reimbursed for their, you know, vehicles and their, and their Ubers and they're flying around and, and all the costs to their cell phones and their iPads and all the stuff that they buy. We're going to get in a situation pretty quickly in the summer where these guys are burning through a million bucks a month. And Castro just raised 1.1 for the quarter. Like, I don't think he's going to even make it to the first debate stage if he doesn't stop spending. And so these guys are going to run out of money. That's why we talk and focus a lot on who's raised the, the first round of money. The only hope for outside the names that we all both just agreed on, outside those top five people, they're not going to, unless they have a moment on, during the course of the campaign and can turn it into something or have a moment at the debate, which assumingly they're splitting their debate stage up into two days. So assumingly they'll have 15 million people watch. 
those other candidates in this field are going to have to be required to have a moment at the debate that turns into a boom that they can capitalize on to even stay in the race to Iowa. Like they're not going to be able to like rent the bus to drive around. And so I think we both agree on the top five. And I believe, I happen to believe that Sanders is the, is the front runner because he's the most likely to, to bust out Beto and he's the most likely to hold on to his base without getting his base eaten into by others. Kamala Harris, if she and Biden are the last two standing in what is, you know, a non you know, she's progressive to me, but Democrats view it a different way. If she looks moderate on the debate stage, Biden has a problem. If she looks progressive left on the, de on the debate stage, Democrat socialist left, B Bernie doesn't have a problem. So that's why I think that Bernie has, you know, his 20% just isn't going to go anywhere. And he can really only grow as other Democrat socialists drop out. So, okay, so there's a, we're all in agreement, there's the top five field. If you were Kamala's campaign manager today, what would be just the next step? What, what would be in one sentence your next step for that campaign? Uh, Mr. Hewitt, I'll start with you. Just what would be, how would you have her kind of turn this around since she's been flying under the radar recently? Well, A, he's right about staff. I'd hire as little staff as possible because the burn rate's what does kill you. Number two, she needs to go live in the Midwest. And number three, she has to raise money daily in a vigorous fashion um, to even be able to do what I'd said in number one and number two, right? But Kamala Harris, you know, where, where, where she'll run strong in what you might call, you know, let's call them the Hillary states for just the purpose of this conversation. So if Kamala Harris is the nominee, she's still going to win the quote Hillary states, right? But can she win the Midwest? And all this talk about, uh, you know, the Midwest and Ohio and this and that has diminished in importance. I think that's silly. Um, I think the Midwest represents a lot of the center moderate voters in the United States and, in, and the folks that Jeff alluded to watching the cable news. I mean, I was telling my buddy the other day, he's like, you know, he, he obsesses and watches MSNBC and drinks the Kool-Aid all day. And I tried to explain to him, I said, look, man. I said, that's like 0.05% of the population watching that at any given moment, if they're lucky, okay? So most people are not paying attention to this stuff. It's, a, it's more of a up in the clouds, oh, there's a presidential, I heard about this candidate, this candidate, yeah, okay, I go vote in the primary. I saw a couple ads, I saw a couple online things, my friends are for this person. And, you know, it, it's a, <laughs> you know, the electorate does not go in fully armed and researched. The electorate goes in and votes for an echo of a name that they most find appealing, right? And a lot of that's ideological based, but, you know, I got Bernie fans and, you know, Bernie bros and all that. And it's like, you know, they can't tell me five things that he's for. And it's like, well, why are you for him? Right? So it's a very, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emotional thing, how people vote, not a logical thing necessarily certainly on the Democratic side of this. Um, and so, you know, a Kamala Harris, she's got to get into the Midwest and prove that she um, understands the issues of regular working class people in the Midwest who do not consider themselves over partisan, but they're certainly going to vote because it's their civic duty. And so they go in, and as so many of my friends in Ohio tell me last cycle, it's, you know, it's going in and, you know, it's like choosing between, uh, you know, death and, another kind of death, death by a gun or death by stabbing, which do you want? Um, nobody wanted to vote for either of these folks. And they went in there and they made a 50.01 decision on who to vote for. I mean, it's, it literally comes down to that. Um, and so I think with Kamala Harris, she's got to come out here and prove to Midwesterners that she can be one of us, that she can be trusted. Um, and that she's not too progress. She's not too, too progressive. Right. I mean, she needs to be in a primary enough to win. But once you pivot to a general election, if she can't win the Midwest, she can't win, period. So my thing is always like, go live in the Midwest. Go get on a bus tour. Not to sound like a Bill Clinton night, but, you know, go see people. You know, I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of got on a rant there. No, you absolutely did. And I heard somebody sum it up well the, the other day. Right now, what everybody knows about the presidential candidates is that that's what's on tables. 
and Elizabeth Warren eats fried chicken with the fork. So, you know, we, we all here are in this bubble where we're following every twist and turn, but most people are not yet completely tuned in. So, Mr. Rowe, if you were Kamala's campaign manager, what's your next step? She's going to keep Biden out. Um, Biden and, and Bernie together represent 50% of the polling right now and 50% of, of um, the likelihood to win. And the other three are going to have to figure out who's going to come out of that to be the, in the final three standing. So she has to do anything she can to keep Biden out. And I don't know where all these stories are coming from. And I don't know who drummed up, you know, the, the lady in Nevada. And I don't know, you know, obviously where this stuff comes from, but it is not a coincidence. And she's the one with the most to gain by not being, by not being, um, by him not getting in. Secondly, I think uh, Jeff is right. She has to own some, uh, find a state where she outworks and out hustles and out, you know, kind of camps everybody else. And so I don't know if that's going to be um, Nevada for her or if she's going to try and go into South Carolina as a firewall, but she needs to find her firewall where she, there is no way she's going to lose the state. And in presidential politics, you have to find a place that if you don't win here, you're going to drop out. That's obviously California for her. But she's got to win an early state or do really well in an early state to have a, enough momentum to overcome anyone else that's won a couple of the first three states. And so if I'm her, I really – I work hard on keeping Biden out, and then I go find a place, probably South Carolina, where I'm going to really put a strong line of defense to win. Thanks for that. I, I'm also wondering, you guys both mentioned the idea of burn rates and burning through cash on campaign staffers. Right now, all the big guns are lining up behind these candidates. We're even seeing it with people going to the Schultz campaign from the Democratic side. What factors are you both looking at? Is, is there any factor when, when looking at who's staffing the campaigns that makes one campaign look more sophisticated or more in the lead than the others when you're just looking at the idea of staffing? Um, you know, staffing is tricky. What I try and do to figure out the health of a campaign is understand how many people are working on the campaign that aren't getting paid. And when you set up your campaign because the volunteer component, you got to get as much of this free. This guy's really, what well, well, we talk about these hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars and all this. I mean, they're barely enough to run in a statewide campaign in a mid-sized state. I mean, any Senate race now, um, any reasonable Senate race in America in a mid-sized or larger state is a 25 to $30 million event. And when you're running a campaign that really requires all of that to compete in the first four states, let alone when you get to California and Texas, I mean, you're going, you're going on, on momentum alone at that point. So really the key is, from, from my understanding, is hiring people. People walk into these races with two different styles of campaign, of campaign folks. Some walk in with a team of people that have been with them for a long time, have been plotting this course for years. Everybody, and that's, that's like, like there's a few with the Carl Roves and, and George W. Bush, and there's, you know, Axelrod with Obama, and you have this kind of, this is just the way they've always done it. Every other campaign, Rubio had a team that, like, did this 2010 and then came on with his. Kasich had one of his, you know, some of his chief kind of operatives came into his Senate race for his, for his presidential race out of his, out of his governor's office. Most of these though are shotgun marriages. There's only about, and I'll just speak to our side because I don't know the Democrat side as well, but there's only really probably less than 10 people that have raised, that have ran a, a national campaign um, and spent more than $25 million. And so, man, every mistake, I know how many I made, just going through and doing a loop of a presidential race and making as many mistakes as you possibly can so you learn from those mistakes is really the most critical part. At the same time, I say that, so your leadership needs to have comfort with the candidate, tell them when they're full of shit and, and execute and miss the obvious mistakes. You know, don't make the mistakes that mostly everybody has to make at least once. So that's one set of parameters. But the second is these operatives in these states, I have a different opinion of them. They all want to go in and hire some person that's locally brilliant in New Hampshire 
or locally brilliant in South Carolina. And I'll, I completely reject that notion. I think it needs to be activists that you engage, that so you bring into your team and try and get them for a lot less money. They don't think they're worth 15,000 bucks a month to give you, you know, to tell you to go to the, you know, pizza kitchen, the pizza ranch, you know, in Keokuk. So I don't think it's, I think those people are overpriced, but having a strong national base team that you either have done it before or you're very comfortable with is the most important. What about you, Mr. Hewitt? What are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, when, and again, you know, the, so it's interesting listening to Mr. Rowe because it's, he's got a great perspective and we see the, the kaleidoscope from different points of view, right? So when I go into a campaign, I mean, I think, first of all, the most important thing about staff is they got to have trust and they got to be willing to work all hours, miss weddings, miss funerals, miss graduations. It's got to really be a cause, right? And so first off, you have to have that. Secondly, I like to go into a campaign and say, okay, how many staff you got? And they'll say 10. I say, how many of them are working on fundraising? And if it's any less than seven, we got a problem, That's right? Good. You know, because uh, paid staff should be to raise money. Yeah, sure, you're going to need some comms people. Yeah, sure, you're going to need some consultants and the rest. Um, but I totally agree with him about you don't need to hire Joe Local um, because he's got the hookup with the county chairman in some critical county. It's just, it's really quite silly. Um, I mean, and then on our side, he, there are probably, he's probably right. There's probably, I don't know if it's less than 10, but maybe less than 40 or 30 or 20 for damn sure on the Democratic side that have ever managed a national race with more than 40 million bucks. I would agree with that too. Um, the manager type people are, you know, they tend to be consultants who get turned into a manager for a cycle because they're the ones that the candidate trusts, right? Um, and so, you know, I always like the, and, and the shotgun marriage thing is, is just dead right. I mean, I like the, the Bush, McKinnon, Axelrod, Obama. I like those setups a whole lot better because they've been doing it for longer together. And they're still going to make mistakes in a national campaign, and that's fine. But that's better than hiring some guy in D.C. that you really don't know that well. You haven't been through the fire with. You don't know how he's going to react when you make a bad mistake. Vice versa. You make spending mistakes. Um, you know, when you manage a campaign, you know, even from state rep, uh, state senate, you know, on up. And, you know, obviously those kind of rates are different in a state like Texas or Ohio or California. We spend a lot of money on that stuff. But, you know, you got to have, um, you know, you got to have trust in the staff. And you, and you got to be able to withstand the mistakes that are going to come, right? And so I don't really love these shotgun marriage type setups. Um, and I think the campaign is where the, the homegrown talent has stayed with them. And they've been looking and thinking about this for a long time is always a much better route for a candidate or, or campaign to go. I mean, I don't think there was this mythology around James Carvel. There was some mythology around Lee Atwater. Um, about they're the guy you got to get to win these things. Um, I, you know, I think there's a whole class. It's a very small class, but there are a class of professionals that are qualified to do it that I don't know if it makes much difference in if you win by who you hire at, as long as they're all top level, right? Um, and, and, you know, and the thing about the staffing is they should, most of them should be raising money or finding people to raise money, or working online to raise money. You know, I hate, 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 hate uh, these campaigns where they pay a ton of money, you know, where they hire either a mail, it used to be a mail firm, now it's the digital firms. You know, they'll pay them $10,000 to raise them 10500 right? Um, you know, and I can't speak to Bernie Sanders' team, and, you know, some of those folks are my friend and, and all that, but, you know, whatever he raised last cycle, what was it, $100 million bucks, or I forget what it was in the end. Um, maybe it was 50. I don't know. I should have done my homework for you, but I can tell you because I broke it down one day, they spent 95% of what they raised on digital communications on fees to the place that raised the money. Right. And obviously they did some TV, but the, you know, they had such a high acquisition cost per dollar that that's why I don't think he runs a, a really serious campaign. I thought it was interesting that he hired a new team. Um, but, but that was much ado about nothing because those were just the TV guys. 
you know, the, the digital guys are the ones where, you know, they're raising the money and the money's really just going back and forth and it just goes up a little bit. It's a, it's a strange setup. So I look at, you know, I want staffers that are, that are raising money um, and I want a, a methodology to raise money that I don't have to spend a lot of money to do it. Great. Thanks for those insights. I want to step away a little bit from the 2020 Democratic. I, just oh. a minute, if you will. I see Mr. Rowe smiling. I'm wondering what he's pondering at the moment. No, I think well, it's just, I like your comments on the Sanders. Um, I have comments on that for other campaigns in, the, in this 2016 race. I won't use any initials, but Ben Carson comes to mind. <laughs> there you go. BC, Ben Carson. <laughs> Um, so, all right, so let's, let's step away a little bit from the 2020 Democratic campaign. I want to talk about just primary campaigns in general and your experience, both of your experiences on those. Which, for both of you, for your respective parties, we'll start with you, Mr. Rowe, which non-incumbent Republican candidates have been successful in, rep in these primary races in recent years and why? Why have we seen some pretty successful primary campaigns from the Republican side, but then also we saw them in 2018 on the Democratic side. So, um, Mr. Rowe, we'll start with you for Republicans. You mean outside outside the presidential, right? Outside of, well, yeah. you can bring in your 2016 perspective from presidential, but both oh, at the well, federal and then congressional level too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eight of the first, uh, eight of the last 13 Republican governors, now it's nine of the last 14 Republican governors had never served a minute in public office until he walked in the governor's mansion, which from an electoral standpoint is it's much easier, I think, on day one to be an outsider, to be a, to be a U.S. senator than it is because it's ideological based and it's issue based um, than it is to be a governor, which is more executive experience. And so it's remarkable how our party's changed from an outsider standpoint. And it's really, you know, um, there's a high level of discomfort in two different areas with Republicans and their and and how they view their leaders and or, or policymakers, I guess I should say. One is they're very dissatisfied with them because they don't believe that they're conservative enough. And that leads a whole kind of, you know, certain tribe of voters that just you are not conservative enough, X, Y, and Z. Then there's another tribe of Republicans that don't believe the, the, the government is performing very well. So they're not necessarily as conservative. They just think it's all screwed up. They don't know why we're still doing debt. They don't understand why we can't pass an infrastructure bill. And, and so when you put those two groups together, it's 100% of Republicans. The Chamber of Commerce types are not happy with the way government's being ran, being run, and the conservatives are not happy because you know, we're spending too much money and doing too many crazy things with our tax dollars. So now you add on a third level and a third level, which now overcomes both currently and, and may, and certainly will in 20 again, and maybe 22 and maybe again in 24, frankly, um, is that you're not supportive enough of the president. And so now, so take those two parts of the, of the, of the party and it's not 50-50 anymore. It's probably 65-35 conservative to establishment. But you take the, that split, and I put over the split that they're not supportive enough of the president. And there is about 12% of the people that would rather you not be supportive of the president. But you take that 88% that, that believe that you're there to support the president's agenda, and now it's not, it's not only – it will get more outsider rather than less insider. The typical yeah. path to be a congressman – used to be state ledge or local office and then run for state senate, get a geographical base of 25 or 30%, make friends with all the big donors in the congressional district and then run and win. That is not it. Now it is stay out of government as far as you can, as long as you can, don't give any money to any politicians because it might hurt you later on, make enough money to self-fund a campaign to run for Congress. That is the new path. And so I think we're probably gonna be in that, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and Mr. Hewitt, I'm wondering, Mr. Rowe mentioned the contingency of people who are Republican primary voters who are looking for their candidate to support the president. I, my gut reaction is that there's that big of a contingency, if not more, on the left. That's the exact opposite. They want to see the candidate who's opposing Trump the most. And I mean, you mentioned AOC earlier, and I think in that race, 
the incumbent wasn't wasn't against Trump enough. Um, what have you noticed in Democratic primaries that have been successful um, against the incumbent? Well, we've only had well. So I'll back up a minute, and I won't I won't address the Trump thing right now, but I'll, or this last cycle right now, but I'll back up a little bit. So um, I, I ended up working for a group in uh, I don't know it was 10, 12, 14, 10 and twelve I think called Campaign for Primary Accountability. And there's actually a story on BuzzFeed today where we're catching a little heat. Um, we were a super PAC um, that went after incumbent congressional members of both parties who we deemed to be. Uh, too extreme, too out of touch, too corrupt, too long in office, you name it. Um, we set up, a, a, an al not an algorithm, but sort of a, a matrix of, this is what makes Congress bad, are these people that have been there so long that they're like petrified almost in their chairs. And so, uh, so anyway, I worked with this group and we knocked off, I think we targeted 10 and beat like four or five, which was actually like historic. I mean, um, it just, you don't yep. see the incumbent. Yeah, incumbent Congress people don't lose many primaries, trust me. And so that was a lot of fun. But, you know, what I think I learned as much as anything in that experience was that on both sides of the coin, people just want change. They want, and change sounds Democrat. They're, uh, so let me put it another way. People are anti-incumbent. They're anti-establishment. They want something different. The Republicans want something different, but for different reasons. The Democrats want something different, right? But voters, by and large, think you know less and less of politicians as time goes on. And I've been doing this since '92, and I could almost argue that every election I've been involved with since then has been an, a, a bit of a change election. Um, now you could obviously argue that, but you know certainly you know, uh, whoever, whoever was the nominee in 08 for the Democrats was definitely going to win. It didn't matter who it was going to be. They were going to win, period, right? Because Democrats were more fired up to change the program than, than Republicans, right? And you can say the same thing about Trump. You know, I think after eight years of Obama, you know, I never thought Trump would be the nominee, but I always thought the Republican probably was going to win, um, whoever that Republican ended up being. Um, and sure enough, I did, you know, like I said, I didn't say, hey, Trump's going to win, but I said, whoever the Republican is is going to win, period. Um, because people were, it was a change thing, right? And so then Trump gets in and it's, it's the historical president, precedent of when you have a president of one party, then in the midterm congressionals, the other party, you know, usually fares pretty well, right? And the more polarized we get, right? So, you know, a Bush and a Clinton were a whole lot closer together than an Obama and a Trump, okay? So the electorate has spread apart even further, right? You could say as far apart as it's ever been in American history, okay? So what that does in the midterm, I think increases the bounce of the opposite party, right? So when Obama was in, he was so despised by the right and Republicans that they were all fired up about their candidates. So they did better, they won a ton of races. I think that happened in Trump's first, first midterm, um, and we'll see how that plays out going forward. But you know, I suspect that that will continue as a trend. Uh, but you asked me about primaries. I don't know if I'm answering the question directly. No, you definitely are. And one thing I'll note: we are seeing just the anti-incumbency trend, but has that really translated into losses? Um, you know, incumbents are still being reelected in Congress at rates in the 90s well into the 90s so if if you were a if you were a democratic candidate in 2020 and you know you're riding this aoc wave if there still is one by then what what would the strategy be to unseat a three-decade incumbent in congress and have you noticed any trends that they're successfully using when they do when we do see incumbent losses well there's two kinds of races right there's there's primaries where you're trying to beat an incumbent Democrat, or you're trying to win an open seat, but it's a Democratic district. So then it's how fast can we run to the left, whether it be the primary or whatever, because the general really doesn't quote matter. Now, if you're in a competitive seat, let's say you're a Democrat, like say Abigail Spanberger in Virginia last cycle, she's running in a, you know, a district that can go back and forth. So she runs to the center to win. Okay. So, you know, 
so this is where I get problems with a lot of political pros is they get so ideological, they can't be strategic in their thinking or adapt to the thinking. You know, if Spanberger is your client, you know, you need to run to the center. You know, if, if AOC is your client, you need to go as far left as you can. So, I mean, it just depends on the nature of the congressional district as to what kind of race you can run. And obviously we all know there's, there used to be more and more of those races in the middle that could flip back and forth. Now there aren't nearly as many, right? But there are still enough that you saw, you know, 40 seats flip this last time, which is, you know, it's like 10% of the Congress. It's not nothing. So Definitely. And at least that's how it works in, on the Democratic side and how I view it uh, as more, you know, a strategist than ideologist, quite frankly. Yeah, thank you. So we'll do two more rapid fire questions. We're ending the near the, the end of our time here. Um, I'd like to know, and we have this question submitted to you, what kind of race do you both enjoy more? An intra-party primary or a general election once you're past the primary? So uh, Ro, we'll start with you. Oh man, uh, I like cut my teeth in open seat primaries. There's nothing better. I think it's a raw, everybody's got the same amount of money. Everybody has, um, you can see a real difference as a consultant in your strategy versus everybody else. And so I really like that, but I will say that there is a, um, there is a component of a big general election race, as long as it's big and there's a bunch of really professional respected Democrats on the team that you're against. There's um, a good team of non no idiots allowed and your team <clears throat> there is a satisfaction, but I think every consultant wants the race to be close enough that your opponent knows that you were the difference. A good Democrat friend of mine told me that once 20 years ago, and I've thought ever since. When in a close race where consultants are really overvalued, mostly, this is about candidates or ideas or positions, we get, we're get we in kind of the gilded age of consultants, so we're all, you know, at, we're geniuses when we win, or we're idiots when we lose. And so I think there's a lot of too much hype, you know, around our profession, but it is nice to win a very close race when your opponents know that you, that you, you may have been the difference. Very interesting. Mr. Hewitt, what about you? You know, to be honest, it's, I was curious to see what he was going to say, but at least most of my friends and I certainly myself, uh, a democratic primary for an open seat or even against an incumbent who needs to go is a whole lot more fun um, than a general election. It's a lot more fun. Um, there's more strategy involved. There's usually less money, so you got to spend it in the smartest way. Um, the turnout's diminished, so you got all those challenges. There's a, lo a lot of reasons why primaries are a much trickier science um, than a general election. Most general elections are fairly baked in in most states. Um, so there's only a handful of big, fun statewide races uh, that aren't really, you know, kind of already baked in, if you will. Um, I mean, I had, you know, I had as much fun, you know, being a runt on the Clinton original campaign in that primary season, uh, just because we were so lean staffed, I got to hang around and hear a bunch of stuff that, you know, a 21 year old probably shouldn't have got to hear. Um, so that was awesome. Um, and then when I was doing John Sharp against Rick Perry in Texas, um, you know, and I had a real role and was the general consultant and uh, you know, really had my hand finger on, on everything going on. That was a great fun race because we had a high profile. Um, we had a really good candidate. We didn't have any idiots on the team. There was a, a no BS factor. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Now it was still an uphill climb and we ended up losing, but at least we had a shot at it. Um, and then, you know, this will sound funny to, to some folks. I agree with Jeff, our profession is totally overblown. Um, and they make way too much of it. Hell, in Texas, they used to have scorecard rankings of consultants, which is just as goofy as can be. But of course, you know, I had my mind tucked away, my little rankings one year that was real good, and I got that tucked away and in the client for, you know, or in the folder for clients, because that's just how it works. But, you know, Adana Howard, who was a state rep, flipped a Republican district in, in suburban Austin in what, oh, three, four, six, I can't remember. But, you know, I had as much fun on that one as any because. We were the underdog in the primary, in a three-way primary, and then we were the underdog in a general, and it was a special election with a runoff. <laughs> so it was a very complex set of factors. In the primary, we all had very little money, although 
we all spent it in vastly different ways. I spent all, all of ours on cable and the others spent all theirs on mail and everybody said I was insane. And then I looked, looked brilliant when we won. Uh, you know, I could have looked just as foolish had we lost. Um, and then when we beat Benson, the Republican and the, the, the special, you know, he outspent us 10 to one and we still won. So that was fun, but I would say most pros really enjoy a, a primary, you know, yeah. they're just fun. That seems like the consensus. Okay, final question. We've talked about what would you do if you were in X situation? I had two staffers at Ballotpedia message me and want you to answer the following question. What have you done really, really wrong in past campaigns? What's the worst mistake you've made? And then we'll finish up here. So Mr. Hewitt, I'll kick it to you and then back to Mr. Rowe. I'd say getting talked into spending too much mail, too much of the campaign budget on mail. And when I finally said to all candidates, if you hire me, we're not doing any mail or we're doing very little, I think life got better. The obvious mistakes, you know, you make obvious mistakes. You spend money on things that didn't work too well um, or whatever, or you say something to the press you shouldn't have. You know, those, are, those always feel pretty stupid. Um, but strategically and tactically, if you're talking about a campaign, I always thought the biggest mistake the campaigns I were involved with, that it was too much money spent on mail. Mr. Rowe, what about I mean, you? direct mail yeah. for those who aren't in the game. Thanks for saving my mailbox, I guess, right? <laughs> um, What's that? Uh, I just said, thanks for saving my mailbox, because usually those go right in my trash. But <laughs> <laughs> Exactly my point. <laughs> so um, uh, which day, which campaign, which minute? I mean, I make a lot of mistakes. But I think probably some of the most high-profile mistakes I've made are um, – a couple of different reasons that we make them. One is because, um, well, a good one. I'll just give a good one. We should have never done the deal at the end of the campaign with the Casey campaign, um, where we switched. We got out of two states for them to get out of two states, and it kind of hung a lantern on that Trump was running against you know a bunch of politicians who were willing to cut deals to win. It looked a little funky. It really needed to happen because we needed Casey, who should have just dropped out, but. We needed him out of Indiana because the non-Trump vote was about 55%. We just had to have all of it. And, you know, looking back on that, it was, it was silly. It was a high stress environment. You know, there wasn't a, um, there wasn't a path to like do anything simpler. And so they didn't want to cut a deal for a while. And so I cut a deal. We probably shouldn't have for sure shouldn't have done, but I mean, I will say my best campaigns are campaigns if I had a list of all the campaigns I did the best job in, they're all ones that, that, that we lost. And the campaigns we won are typically the ones I ran the worst campaign. So it's, um, it's a very bottom line tough business, but I make a lot of mistakes a lot of days. The only rule I have is to never make the same mistake twice. Um, so I, I try and learn from that. But the Kasich thing was probably one of the bigger ones that, outward facing that were, you know, in retrospect, pretty embarrassing to have done. Well, thank you both. Those are both honest answers and always appreciated. Um, that kind of ends us for today. Thank you for joining us, our audience and to the Jeffs. And hopefully we can check in with you both as the campaign gets underway and talk more about strategy. But thank you both. Head to ballotpedia.org if you want a recording of this video. Um, and if not, just check in with us as the campaigns get underway. So have a great day, everybody. Thanks. See ya. Thank you.